Extracts from Adam's Diary Monday This new creature with the long hair is a good deal in the way. It is always hanging around and following me about. I don't like this. I'm not used to company. I wish it would stay with the other animals. Cloudy today. Wind in the east. Think we shall have rain. We? Where did I get that word? I remember now. The new creature uses it. Tuesday. Been examining the great waterfall. It is the finest thing on the estate, I think. The new creature calls it Niagara Falls. Why, I'm sure I do not know. Says it looks like Niagara Falls. That is not a reason. It is mere waywardness and imbecility. I get no chance to name anything myself. The new creature names everything that comes along before I can get in a protest. And always the same pretext is offered. It looks like the thing. There is the dodo, for instance. Says the moment one looks at it, one sees at a glance that it looks like a dodo. It will have to keep that name, no doubt. It wearies me to fret about it, and it does no good anyway. Dodo? It looks no more like a dodo than I do. Wednesday. Built me a shelter against the rain, but could not have it to myself in peace. The new creature intruded. When I tried to put it out, it shed water out of the holes it looks with and wiped it away with the back of its paws and made a noise, such as some of the other animals make when they are in distress. I wish it would not talk. It's always talking. That sounds like a cheap fling at the poor creature, a slur, but I do not mean it so. I have never heard the human voice before, and any new and strange sound intruding itself here upon the solemn hush of these dreaming solitudes offends my calm and seems a false note. And this new sound is so close to me. It is right at my shoulder, right at my ear, first on one side and then on the other, and I am only used to sounds that are more or less distant from me. I have never heard the human voice before, and any new and strange sound intruding itself here upon the solemn hush of these dreaming solitudes offends my ear and seems a false note. And this new sound is so close to me, it is right at my shoulder, right at my ear, first on one side and then on the other, and I am only used to sounds that are more or less distant from me. Friday. The naming goes recklessly on in spite of anything I can do. I had a very good name for the estate, and it was musical and pretty. Garden of Eden. Privately, I continue to call it that, but not any longer publicly. The new creature says it is all woods and rocks and scenery, and therefore has no resemblance to a garden, says it looks like a park, and does not look anything but a park. Consequently, without consulting me, it has been new named Niagara Falls Park. This is sufficiently high-handed, it seems to me, and already there is a sign-up. Keep off the grass. My life is not as happy as it was. Saturday. The new creature eats too much fruit. We are going to run short, most likely. We again. That is its word. Mine too, now, from hearing it so much. Good deal of fog this morning. I do not go out in the fog myself. The new creature does. It goes out in all weathers and stumps right in with its muddy feet and talks. It used to be so pleasant and quiet here. Sunday. Pulled through. This day is getting to be more and more trying. It was selected and set apart last November as a day of rest. I had already six of them per week before. This morning found the new creature trying to clod apples out of that forbidden tree. Monday. The new creature says its name is Eve. That is all right, I have no objections. Says it is to call it by when I want it to come. I said it was superfluous then. The word evidently raised me in its respect, and indeed it is a large, good word and will bear repetition. It says it is not an it, it is a she. This is probably doubtful, yet it is all one to me. What she is were nothing to me if she would but go by herself and not talk. Tuesday. She has littered the whole estate with execrable names and offensive signs. This way to the whirlpool. This way to Goat Island. Cave of the Winds. This way. 
She says this park would make a tidy summer resort if there were any custom for it. Summer resort? Huh? Another invention of hers. Just words without any meaning. What is a summer resort? But it is best not to ask her. She has such a rage for explaining. Friday, she has taken to beseeching me to stop going over the falls. What harm does it do? Says it makes her shudder. I wonder why. I have always done it. Always liked the plunge and coolness. I supposed it was what the falls were for. They have no other use that I can see, and they must have been made for something. She says they were only made for scenery, like the rhinoceros and the mastodon. I went over the falls in a barrel, not satisfactory to her. Went over in a tub, still not satisfactory. Swam the whirlpool and the rapids in a fig leaf suit. Got much damaged. Hence tedious complaints about my extravagance. I am too much hampered here. What I need is a change of scene. Saturday, I escaped last Tuesday night and travelled two days and built me another shelter in a secluded place and obliterated my tracks as well as I could. But she hunted me out by means of a beast which she has tamed and calls a wolf, and came making that pitiful noise again and shedding that water out of the places she looks with. I was obliged to return with her, but will presently emigrate again when occasion offers. She engages herself in many foolish things, among others. To study out why the animals called lions and tigers live on grass and flowers, when, as she says, the sort of teeth they wear would indicate that they were intended to eat each other. This is foolish, because to do that would be to kill each other, and that would introduce what, as I understand it, is called death. And death, as I have been told, has not yet entered the park, which is a pity on some accounts. Sunday. Pulled through. Monday, I believe I see what the week is for. It is to give time to rest up from the weariness of Sunday. Seems a good idea. She has been climbing that tree again. Clodded her out of it. She said nobody was looking. Seems to consider that a sufficient justification for chancing any dangerous thing. Told her that. The word justification moved her admiration. And envy too, I thought. It is a good word. Tuesday. She told me she was made out of a rib taken from my body. This is at least doubtful, if not more than that. I have not missed any rib. She is in much trouble about the buzzard. Says grass does not agree with it. Is afraid she can't raise it. Thinks it was intended to live on decayed flesh. The buzzard must get along the best it can with what is provided. We cannot overturn the whole scheme to accommodate the buzzard. Saturday, she fell in the pond yesterday when she was looking at herself in it, which she is always doing. She nearly strangled and said it was most uncomfortable. This made her sorry for the creatures which live there, which she calls fish, for she continues to fasten names onto things that don't need them and don't come when they are called by them. Which is a matter of no consequence to her. She is such a numbskull anyway. So she got a lot of them out and brought them in last night and put them in my bed to keep warm. But I have noticed them now and then all day, and I don't see that they are any happier there than they were before. Only quieter. When night comes, I shall throw them outdoors. I will not sleep with them again, for I find them clammy and unpleasant to lie among when a person hasn't anything on. Sunday. Pulled through. Tuesday, she has taken up with a snake now. The other animals are glad, for she was always experimenting with them and bothering them, and I am glad because the snake talks, and this enables me to get a rest. Friday, she says the snake advises her to try the fruit of that tree, and says the result will be a great and fine and noble education. I told her there would be another result too. It would introduce death into the world. That was a mistake. It had been better to keep the remark to myself. It only gave her an idea. She could save the sick buzzard and furnish fresh meat to the despondent lions and tigers. I advised her to keep away from the tree. She said she wouldn't. I foresee trouble. We'll emigrate. Wednesday. 
I have had a variegated time. I escaped last night and rode a horse all night as fast as he could go, hoping to get clear out of the park and hide in some other country before the trouble should begin. But it was not to be. About an hour after sun-up, as I was riding through a flowery plain where thousands of animals were grazing, slumbering or playing with each other according to their want, all of a sudden they broke into a tempest of frightful noises, and in one moment the plain was a frantic commotion and every beast was destroying its neighbour. I knew what it meant. Eve had eaten that fruit, and death was come into the world. The tigers ate my horse, paying no attention when I ordered them to desist, and they would have eaten me if I had stayed, which I didn't, but went away in much haste. I found this place outside the park, and was fairly comfortable for a few days, but she has found me out, found me out, and has named the place Tonawanda. Says it looks like that. In fact, I was not sorry she came, for there are but meagre pickings here, and she brought some of those apples. I was obliged to eat them. I was so hungry. It was against my principles, but I find that principles have no real force except when one is well fed. She came curtained in boughs and bunches of leaves, and when I asked her what she meant by such nonsense and snatched them away and threw them down, she tittered and blushed. I had never seen a person titter and blush before, and to me it seemed unbecoming and idiotic. She said I would soon know how it was myself. This was correct. Hungry as I was, I laid down the apple, half-eaten, certainly the best one I ever saw, considering the lateness of the season, and arrayed myself in the discarded boughs and branches, and then spoke to her with some severity, and ordered her to go and get some more, and not make such a spectacle of herself. She did it, and after this we crept down to where the wild beast battle had been, and collected some skins, and I made her patch together a couple of suits proper for public occasions. They are uncomfortable, it's true, but stylish, and that is the main point about clothes. I find she is a good deal of a companion. I see I should be lonesome and depressed without her, now that I have lost my property. Another thing. She says it is ordered that we work for our living hereafter. She will be useful. I will superintend. Ten days later. She accuses me of being the cause of our disaster. She says, with apparent sincerity and truth, that the serpent assured her that the forbidden fruit was not apples, it was chestnuts. I said I was innocent then, for I had not eaten any chestnuts. She said the serpent informed her that chestnut was a figurative term meaning an aged and mouldy joke. I turned pale at that, for I have made many jokes to pass the weary time, and some of them could have been of that sort though I had honestly supposed that they were new when I made them. She asked me if I had made one just at the time of the catastrophe. I was obliged to admit that I had made one to myself, though not aloud. It was this. I was thinking about the falls, and I said to myself, how wonderful it is to see that vast body of water tumble down there. Then, in an instant, a bright thought flashed into my head, and I let it fly, saying... It would be a deal more wonderful to see it tumble up there. <laughs> and I was just about to kill myself with laughing at it when all nature broke loose in war and death and I had to flee for my life. There, she said with triumph, that is just it. The serpent mentioned that very chest and called it the first chestnut and said it was coeval with the creation. Alas, I am indeed to blame. Would that I were not witty. Oh, that I never had that radiant thought. Next year. We have named it Cain. She caught it while I was up country trapping on the north shore of the Erie. Caught it in the timber a couple of miles from our dugout. Or it might have been four, she isn't certain which. It resembles us in some ways and may be a relation. This is what she thinks, but this is an error in my judgment. The difference in size warrants the conclusion that it is a different and new kind of animal. A fish, perhaps, though when I put it in the water to see, it sank, and she plunged in and snatched it out before there was an opportunity for the experiment to determine the matter. I still think it is a fish, but she is indifferent about what it is and will not let me have it to try. I do not understand this. The coming of the creature seems to have changed her whole nature. 
and made her unreasonable about experiments. She thinks more of it than she